Thanks for tuning in. This is going to be a good one. I can't believe they're even letting this guy on the show. <laughs> it's Steve Mathis. What's up, Steve? What's up, man? Yeah, how how many people couldn't said no before you had to do this one with me? Like, how low <laughs> did you go? Was was Dark Side busy? Uh, you know, how, how did I make the cut? But I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun. We'll have a good time, actually. And it's the, the timing is funny. And uh, look, the show's called Beyond the Track, so let's go beyond or behind the curtain for a second. Um, I record these usually on Tuesday mornings. Um, next Tuesday morning, I'll be at your house, so I couldn't do this. So that's why we're doing it early, because I'm actually going to be at your house next Tuesday. Do you right, remember that, that coming out. next week? Yeah, that's you great. You do remember I'm, I'm flying in next week. You yeah. remember that, right? Yes, I do. I can't wait. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a great time. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, can't wait to talk to you about a number of different things. But I just want to start by saying, dude, Pulp MX. Like, uh, look, it's you've been around now for a long time, and it's it's grown. It's it's continuing to grow. The things you're doing on the video side, you're still writing articles, which I, I don't. I, you got to explain to me why you're still doing that. Do you just love it or something? But uh, I, I want to dive into all these different things that you're doing with Pulp MX, but I just want to start by saying congrats again on, on what you've built and the impact you have on the sport. Yeah, thanks, man. It's been cool, right? Like I, I started podcasting in 2007 and yeah, it's 2021 and, and the sport is, I still love it, man. I, I mean, I grew up racing and riding like you did and I'm a failed pro, unlike you, I failed. And then, you know, got into being a mechanic and then started being a media guy like this is great I, I make a living and a good living covering motorcycle racing that I used to you know read cycle news uh, or, or you know I just can't believe it sometimes yes I get grouchy and yes sometimes it sucks but overall when you think about how I make my living I go to motocross races I hang out with my friends I watch an exciting race eight times out of ten it's exciting and then I have to talk about it like there's worse ways to make a living that's for sure i mean i could own a hand cleaner company or something that that's tough gig or you could be a mechanic yeah oh god or a flagman <laughs> either one yeah so it's awesome you know what i mean like it's really really cool that this has succeeded and it's worked and there's been some tough times along the way to make this work but um overall man yeah it, it's pretty good i mean the the, the worst thing i got to do is, is fly to a place you know, you know, and go watch the motorcycle race. Not so bad. So, I, again, in the last, say, five to ten years, it's it's revved up, right? Your numbers have grown. You Now you're bringing in the video side. Obviously, you got a good people around you. I hate to admit, but Marks is really good. So this is like a fun chapter, right, where the growth and all that is fun. But take me back to the very first couple of podcasts. Are, are you, at that point, thinking it's going to end up where it is now with this YouTube video show, this huge podcast, and then the network below just the Pulp Show, all the other things. You, did you have any idea that this was the end result of what you were working on? Or was it like, I'll just try this and see what happens? No, I didn't. I didn't at all. The whole thing with podcasts. So like way back then, nobody knew what podcasting was. It was pretty new. There was a sports podcast that I like to listen to. And I'm like, it was sort of, I don't remember, it was an interview with somebody, like some athlete. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like, this is great. I, I'd love to learn more about this athlete. I think, I think it was a football player. Anyways, I'm like, is there anything like this in moto? And shout out to the DMXS guys. They were doing uh, podcasting before me, but they weren't doing long form stuff. It was mostly just, hey, let's get a, a, a guy on that raced and talked to him for 15 minutes. And then, you know, that, that was it. So I was like, man, like, you know, uh, RJ and Lampson and Bailey and, and McGrath. And, you know, I kind of knew these guys from being a mechanic. And I'm like, I want to hear their stories, right? Like, you know, you've been there, Daniel, bench racing with these guys at a bar or whatever or at dinner. And you're just like, this is amazing. Well, I want to capture that. And that's really what got me started. Like, okay, I need to hear the stories of these guys. Okay. Is there anything like this in moto? No. Okay. How hard can it be? Well, I literally bought the book Podcasting for Dummies. Uh, and started from there. And my first setup was like 40 bucks. Um, uh, it was a little deal from Radio Shack. It was a, a corded phone, a little thing that you put in between the corded phone and the computer, and then a program um, to record it all. And that was my, I had to hold the phone to my ear like a regular, you know, corded phone. And that was my first setup. 
And I started and dude, I had to, you know, I had to explain everybody what a podcast is. I had to say, Hey man, we're just going to be recording this. So everything you say will be recorded. So if you want to say something differently, let me know. I can ask you again or like whole deal. Right. Uh, and then that was working pretty well. People were digging it, but it was still, it wasn't a moneymaker. It was really just passion. I just love to talk to these guys. I just had so many questions from so many motocross actions that I read over the years. Right. And, and so that how, that's how it started. And then the pulp show started in 2010. So three years later, I start the pulp show and I wanted that to be uh, more of a morning radio type of moto show. My wife is a big Howard Stern listener. I got into it a little bit here and there. And I'm like, and again, shout out to the DMXS guys. They were doing that. But I was like, if I'm going to start a show like theirs, I got to be different. I got to have segments. I got to have funny phone calls. We did a lot of those in the beginning. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, you know, have inter, inter show drama with my producers or phone guys, right? Uh, all the stuff that kind of Stern did. And I took that and, you know, wanted to make it into moto. So I wanted to make it different than DMXS guys. They didn't take phone calls. So then I'm like, oh, I got to take phone calls from listeners because that's going to be different and something that's not out there. And that was, Daniel, if I could tell you the hours I spent setting up the phone equipment and to make a phone call sound good through a mixer, through a digital hybrid, it's called. If I could tell you the hours I spent calling my wife, can you hear me now? How's this? How's that? <laughs> can you hear me now? Are we good. How's this? Is this better? Are you there? Hello. If you, hours hours of that but uh you know we got it working we got it going six phone lines and and uh you know we obviously upgraded the equipment along the way and everything yeah it's it's been really cool man there's been some and you know there's been some moments on the pulp show uh, in our sport that have sort of captured everybody's attention along the way and and you know gone viral in our sport which is which is pretty cool over the years it, there's like these timestamps in history over the last 10 years where a certain guest, a certain show, something, and it's like you could always yeah. fall back and know what was going on at that time because of that show. Uh, and that's one of the things that, again, you've been able to capture is kind of keeping this show in a uh, in a timeline of, of coverage, if that makes sense. Because, again, you're covering it from so many different angles. But, yeah, you go back in time and you remember this show and you're like, God, I remember where the sport was at that time. And that, that's obviously probably fun for you to look back on now. Uh, I guess my next question is, where along the line was there a realization that this was working? Because, again, you've turned it into a living. It's yeah. a great living. You have a great job. But at some point, it went from passion to, whoa, this is working. Like, there's an audience. They're in every week. They want more. When did that kind of kick when it went from passion to, hey, I think I can make a life with this? Um, good question, man. I, and I've told this story a few times, but so, uh, I quit being a mechanic. I got a job at parts unlimited, but I still wanted to do the media guy. Right. So I was doing the podcasts and I was doing some stuff for racer X, but it wasn't paying great. And the podcast stuff, I had one sponsor. Um, it was a shift shift Canada because I was early on working for racer X Canada and it wasn't really making many money, but I was working at parts unlimited and then they, they let me go um, after a year. And then I started getting a job with a couple other companies, kind of doing some consulting slash uh, contract work for them, uh, you know, working with race teams and stuff like that. But then I had a deal for a company for um, a year. And then in June of that year, they pulled the plug. And I said, well, how are we going to figure out this contract? Like you, I signed a contract for a year. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you, there, there's no figuring out. That's it. You're done. And I'm like, but you owe me six months pay. And they're like, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. So um, that was one. Okay, I'm like diving in. I'm I'm a media guy now, right? And I think I was getting thirty grand from Racer X for the year, uh, and then that was it. That was my really my only source of income, and a few riding gigs along the way. But I'm like, hey, I'm gonna do this. I gotta do this. I gotta go to the races, right? I, I'm not gonna be the guy to report on the races uh, sitting at home. You just don't see everything. You don't know everything. You don't talk to anybody. And I started going to the races. And Daniel, at one point. My American Express credit card was up to $21,000. And the minimum payment was 900 and something dollars a month, right? It was almost as much as my mortgage. And I wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. Like I, I, I was so stressed, but I'm like, nope, gonna do it, gotta do it, right? That's how it works. And so slowly just started getting sponsors and you know, kind of getting some traction. And uh, this was in 08, you know, 07, 08, 09. I started the Pulp Show in 2010. I had a buddy, a gentleman named Kenny Watson, who uh, you should probably get on one of these uh, if he can figure out Zoom. It, it would be great. 
Um, and Watson came in from Vegas, replaced my original co-host after like six episodes. And Watson, as you know, is a character. And that really helped. People were like, what is Kenny gonna say? And he didn't even know sometimes. And that kind of, once Kenny came on, he brought a little bit of money too, um, with some couple of sponsors that he did, B2B. And uh, man, it started taking off when Watson was there because he was telling some crazy stories. He was giving some outrageous takes. He was involved in uh, H&H, Heart 9010. I was coming from the other side. And that's Daniel when it started coming around. Like I would say a year into the Pulp Show. So this was my fourth year of being, third or fourth year of being full-time media guy. I was still having that credit card bill, but around a year of the Pulp Show, so 2011, started getting a hey, how much to advertise uh, you know blah 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 we were getting i think i remember the first stat package we were at three thousand per show and i'm like that's pretty good then it was five thousand per show and then it was seven thousand per show we add them up every four months and, and then it was, so we started growing advertisers started coming people started to see uh a return on that kind of stuff race tech was early on uh, a lot of these guys came on early and that's when daniel so 2011 i'm like hey I can do this. I can cover this. I can go to all the races. I can fly, rental car, hotel, and make some money and cover the races. Let's do, let's do this. Dang. I mean, was that kind of weird when you're looking at those analytics and you're going, it's, it's growing again, it's growing again, it's growing again. And obviously word of mouth is part of that. And then obviously your connections with racer X, you being there every weekend, getting these riders on, it's like an accumulation, right? But yeah. I mean, at what point did you look at it and go, man, like we have an audience that truly is like depending on the show. I'm sure you're starting to get hit up by people like, you know, if you miss a week or like what the, I mean, I know you get it now. You get hammered if you take a week yeah. off. It, was that all happening at the same time too when the finances started coming in? Is that when the fan base started becoming like, like a real fan base? Not people that just listen, but like Pulp fans and Steve Mathis fans where they demanded, demanded shows, not just hoped you had one out. Yeah, I, I think right around then, right? And it was like, what's Watson going to do? Watson stormed out of the show a couple of times, threw his headset down and just walked out because he was mad with some of the stuff we were arguing about. And, you know, we would get into it with him. Him and I would get into it. Like, and sometimes, like I said, I wanted a morning radio stern feel to the show. And sometimes it went too far. And I was like, oh boy, like, uh, I don't know if Kenny's coming back next week. But that was the kind of stuff that was happening. And I got to give full credit to Watson. He, he really helped me get into it and then I was playing a character at that point and trying to antagonize him sometimes because I'm like this is good radio right I did go yeah. too far uh, sometimes but that was and then so then people started being like hey man can I get a photo of you and you know can I get a picture of you at the races and I'm like shit okay all right this thing's really working and, or you know mechanics and managers would be like I can't believe what Watson said or you know or, did, did he say this or did you say this because I'd be like yeah we kind of did because I've, I've always <laughs> wanted to treat this sport you know, like a real sport, like rumors and innuendos and, and speculation. That's the stuff like there's like these teams and riders, they don't all get it, man. Like, hey, like you're making a lot of money, not always, but you're making money. This is your professional. Us talking about you is a good thing. Even if it's like, hey, man, did you hear what this guy did? Uh, I, I heard he did this. Or I heard he could be going here. Like, dude, that's a good thing. You, you think Runkles? Runkles would love for us to break down Runkles. Like that's right. the goal right? is to be relevant, to get broken down by outsiders and third party people. And that's what we did. And so we started getting in trouble from people. And I was always like, man, this is a good thing. We're talking about you. Like we're, people are interested. Fans want to know what's going on with you. And just like Daniel, you follow the NFL and everything else. I just, that's how, you know, that's half the deal is the, the speculation and, and the rumors and what's, who's going where. And so I thought we did a, I thought, and this is not a slam on the Moto Media, but it's a slam on the Moto Media. At the time, a lot of these guys didn't do that shit. They didn't want to, they want to be friends with the riders. They want to shoot photos right about the race and go home and hang out, right? And I didn't care if I was friends with these guys. I mean, I was because I was a mechanic for so long, but ultimately I have to talk about these guys or write about them like they don't know me. And, and, right. and because I don't want to, I don't care if I offend you. If I do, I'm sorry, but here's why I wrote what I wrote or what I said, what I said. Um, so I feel like that's how I, the Moto Media was pretty tame. Jody was throwing out barbs, but no one even took Jody Weisel that seriously back then. He wasn't at the races, but he would throw out barbs for sure. Um, 
but I don't think they were always well-founded because he wasn't around, right? Uh, but the other guys, the guys that went to the races every week, man, it was pretty tame. It was pretty tame. And so I felt like I could treat this like a real sport. And hopefully I did. And I think now, I mean, obviously it's a little bit of the times we're in, right? This is 12 years ago. Right. Uh, but now I feel like I have started that, you know what I mean? A little bit of shit talking with the riders, a little bit of growing down with them, a little bit of being hard on them when you, when you need to, or, you know, but at the same time, praising guys when it's deserved, when it's deserved. So I like to think I changed some of that, Daniel. Well, and we'll, we'll, I'm going to make a statement right now and I don't want to get back to it, but your willingness to take shots at your own friends, like an Osborne or an AC, yet they keep coming back and talking to you openly, I think proves that there's a formula there that works, that you can be honest. And they're starting to like realize that that's okay and put up. Like, again, I think you're harder sometimes on the guys you're closest to. And they keep coming back on the show, willing to tell you everything. So I, again, I think you kind of broke the mold a little bit on that. I think the riders are realizing that it's okay. Not all. But would you yeah. agree that most of the riders are coming around to the idea that, hey, you can take a little criticism, you can take some heat, it's part of the job, and you can be okay with that. I, I feel like there's been a change lately in that, and you're, you're uh, I, I would uh, say, to blame for that advancement. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> but, like, I'm at the races. Like, if you have a problem with something I said or wrote, I'm there, man. Come talk to me, and I'll tell you why I wrote. And I've had this exact conversation dozens of times. Hey, Mathis, did you say that, like, I, I, uh, I sucked this week and you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, I did because you should be better. You, you did. You no, know, I you did sucked. say this. <laughs> you have a factory bike and you should be better. And you know that. And, and nine times out of 10, the riders would be like, yeah, you're right. Like, uh, Hey, that was a greasy move. What you did on that guy. Like you knocked him down. Like, what do you want me to say? You knocked the dude down. Uh, Michael Essie, you drilled Brock Tickle in a swing arm. You know what I mean? I dented it. Like that's probably not good. Um, you know, things like that. And, and these yeah. riders, most of them are like, yeah, man, I get it. You know, and I'm like, okay, cool. Like, and dude, it's nothing personal. Like, like March Banks right now, like March Banks doesn't like me. He thinks that, uh, you know, all I do is talk shit on him and, you know, the, the departure from Pro Circuit and everything else. But you know what? I was walking by the Club MX rig this weekend. March Banks was there. I got an interview. I think he was surprised. He was like, uh, okay. Like, I, I'm like, hey, you got, I don't care. Like, I'll talk to you. But I, I, if I see you, I'll get your story. Nothing personal. I want to talk to you about Southwick. And if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But I think guys like that are like, oh, this dude hates me. It's like, no, dude, I'll, I'll talk to anybody. I, I don't care. I, I just, I separate the, the personalities, the feelings from the sport. You know what I mean? And, and so that's kind of my attitude on that stuff. I mean, they have a job to do. You have a job to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you make your living off of being honest. So I, again, I think, I think that's all changing. I've, I've seen it now up close and personal too. There's been a big change with that and you're, uh, you're responsible for it. So good job for all of us. <laughs> um, going back to Pulp Max, I've listened to the early episodes. You could tell the framework was there on what you're doing now. It was obviously in the beginning you were working at the Kinks, but what do you think helped the show grow from then to now? Is it the advancements in technology, your understanding? you polishing um, your job as the host and, and kind of steering the ship? Or is it a little bit of everything? I mean, what, because those early shows, like you could tell what you were doing and now it's like the, the final product of what yeah. you were doing so long ago. You know, some people, it's funny, we've reached this stage, Daniel, where we get listeners that are like, man, I miss the old shows. You guys were, were you guys were better in the old days. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, you know, like, I still think we are, are, are edgy or whatever, but, um, it's funny, yeah, so we've already reached the point where we're nostalgic for the old shows. Um, it's a little bit of everything, I think. Um, so Watson left in 20, I don't know, 16 or something. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but he uh, he had to go back to California for the for, for h and They were relocating there. And honestly, he was going through some personal stuff and he didn't like it anymore. And he, the show, <coughs> excuse me, the last couple of months of Kenny's co-hosting duties were not good he was not in a good place he wasn't happy he didn't want to be there I, I was like do you need more money or like what's your deal like and he just he didn't care so he left and as much credit as I give him for kickstarting the show I also have to say that him leaving was a good thing he didn't want to be here it was getting a little repetitive it, it was you know blah 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 so he left and I was like kind of like oh shit what do I do now I live in Vegas so it's not like I can just go down to Temecula and uh, you know grab somebody who's partying down there um, 
so that was when we started doing the, the rotating stuff where I'm like, I think I can do this with different guys every week. And honestly, that was a boom, like getting different people in the studio. You came in and uh, uh, Kiefer started coming up. Um, Pingree was in for a while, uh, just sort of a rotating co-host, right? And my buddies would come up. Parabinos was in a, some of those early ones uh, and a JT, of course. And, and I was like, well, you know, so that kind of stuff cost me money because now I was paying people's expenses and buying their flights or whatever. But again, I've always believed in like investing in yourself to, to, to do things, right? Like every time, I think literally, Daniel, every time I've invested in myself, it's worked out. Like uh, whether I bought a house that maybe I couldn't afford or bought some equipment that I didn't need, but it would sound good or whatever, it's always worked out. And so I, I definitely put some of the money that I was making into the show to get people here. And that was a big step. I remember the, 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 the listener numbers uh, early on when I brought different people up jumped. Enough. I don't remember if it was a year, if it was six months, but something I remember being like, oh, people are really digging the different co-hosts because everybody had a different story, right? You're an ex-racer. Uh, this guy was an ex-mechanic. This guy was an ex-team manager whatever it was. And so that start, that part started really working out well, bringing in the different co-hosts. The show took off from there. And then we, we put them on video, but just with a janky GoPro attached to the table. Uh, did you ever see, you know, you ever watch any of those? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Not great, but that's how we were doing video early on. And uh, those weren't really getting any numbers um, really. And we were like, well, I'm on video, but people just didn't want to see it. So then, you know, three years ago or two years ago, invested about $8,000 into lights and cameras, hired another guy to take the phone call position. Mark's moved up. He, uh, he moved up in the company to the video <laughs> producer guy. Yeah, it was you know big step up for him. And, uh, and now we, you know, that really made a big jump. Get it? So there's a whole section of YouTube people that I don't want to get into, but they only watch YouTube. And so we started professionally making the shows you know, and, and dude, it looks as good as like a regular show. It's phenomenal. And, and so we did that. And then that was another jump two years ago. That was literally like a six or 7,000 jump per show list uh, jump for, from that kind of stuff, from making it look more professional. And of course, the, you know, the money came in in terms of advertisers. So yeah, that was the Watson, Watson leaving, co-hosts, video equipment. That's sort of been the evolution of it. Those are like those steps where you're like, yeah. wow, that worked, boom, that worked, boom. Um, and, yeah. and obviously, yeah. again, it's it's part of that development as you go and as you get better at things. Obviously, again, I, I love Marks. I think, I mean, I think he's a huge asset for you. He does a great job. Your guys' relationship is perfect too. Uh, one thing that I noticed, Steve, is as I listen to all your shows, I've told you before, I, I hate to admit I'm a fan of what you do, um, but you have a very natural delivery. You're always you, but I know it's not that easy when you're dealing with say me in the co-host chair, um, you know, versus Charles Caslew, who you had on last night, you kind of have to be a little bit different. How do you, do you prepare for that? Or do you just have kind of an interchangeable personality where the delivery always feels the same, but you kind of have to be a different person based on who's sitting across from you? Yeah, that's, uh, that's very astute of you to notice that, Blair. Uh, yeah, wow, good, good job. You're right, I do. I think about that, right? I'm like, okay, who's coming in? Well, Millsaps is in last week and he's a, as we found out, he's a really interesting, good talker. So yeah. I'm going to let him carry it. I'm going to throw things at him and let him carry it. Chuck Caslew, little quieter guy. I'm going to pepper him with my thoughts and my opinions and, and bench race with him. And yeah, absolutely. You have to think about who's sitting across from you. And sometimes the guys aren't good, right? You're not quite sure, but I've got a pretty good base now too of who's good and who's not. Like, you know, you're coming in next week, you host a show, you do 8 million things. You're a good talker. I can let you go on. You know what I mean? I can let you go. And I know you're going to offer something intelligent and educated. And then while you're doing that, I can think of other questions and things to throw at you. So yeah, you absolutely have to adjust to whoever's sitting across from you. Uh, but that's part of the fun, right? That's, that's absolutely part of the part of the fun. Well, and also makes it feel different too. I'm wondering if that's part of that big leap you talked about, because with Watson, it, 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 they were good. I mean, Kenny was the, such an individual. Like he's yeah. he's Kenny. There's no Kenny. But then all of a sudden, their, your show just feels different all the time. Like every week, it's got its like when Kiefer's on, it's a it's a Kiefer episode. You could just feel it. 
Yeah. Um, is that kind of the method again with that change up instead of finding someone permanent? Did you do that off of choice or did you not have a choice and had to go with a rotating chair? Would you, if you go back in time, did you want someone full time or did you want to all of a sudden kind of like, Hey, let me make every show have its own feel by bringing in someone new. Probably back then I wanted to get somebody full time, but I lived in Vegas. There was nobody here. Right. So I had to make do, but now I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't, I would if I, if say Kiefer moved here to Vegas, right, tomorrow, I would have him in, but I would have a third person in. You know, I really like the dynamic of a third person that came from a different part of the industry, has different thoughts and feelings. Um, so I would add, if, that, if I would add a regular guy, but then I would add a third guy because I really like that. Like Cole Seeley, we had Seeley in three weeks ago and dude, he was great. Like who, was awesome. who knew Cole Seeley was, was, would, you know, had that much to offer. Uh, he was great. He was fantastic. And, and, you know, Millsaps, he came in six months ago or whatever. He was great. So I, I think the whole thing and how I got started was I was curious, right? And you, and you can ask my wife, like, if we watch a Western, I'm on Wikipedia reading about that movie, or I want to know, I'm very curious. I, I want to know stuff. I, I Googled the dumbest thing the other day and I, well, I, was, <laughs> I can't even remember. But anyways, um, so I'm curious. I want to know. I want to get into the story. So that's what makes the different co-hosts great to me is I want to get into it. I want to know what you think. I want to, you know, yes, I can sometimes hog the screen for sure. Uh, I, you know, that's a criticism of people where I just interrupt people, which I do. It's probably the worst thing just because I can't wait to get my thoughts out because they're so damn important. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, but I, I'm curious. So Getting people in that chair is, is a curious thing for me. And it's, and it's really, really cool that way uh, to do it. So Steve, when you look at your show and obviously the progression that it's made, uh, walk me through what it feels like for you when you have a writer like a Justin Barr show or Davey Millsap's best example, who does not like you for a long period of time. And then they come around and now they're on the show co-host. I mean, what does it feel like to you? Not only from just a, you're probably excited, like, oh, I'm going to get Davey Millsaps, but it's just that turn from someone who wouldn't talk to you to someone who now, like, hey, I'll drive to your house and come on your show with you. Like, what's that feel like for you when they come around? Well, honestly, I don't take – I mean, it's cool. It's great. It's awesome. Like, Josh Hansen's another example, right? Um, so, yeah, it's kind of neat. It's interesting. Like, yeah, Davey wouldn't – Davey hated me forever. Uh, kind of like Anderson now. Jason Anderson's not a fan, right? I, I think it's – I again, it's nothing personal, like – I, I, I praise these guys when they, when they deserve it and I'll criticize them when they deserve it. So when they come back around, I mean, I'm not going to lie or, or, or RC, your buddy RC, we're good now. We might be, RC and I might be tighter than you and him right now. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's fine. Like I don't, you know, I just think it's, it's all the natural evolution of stuff. And I honestly call me stubborn, which people have. I feel like, dude, I haven't changed. I'm the same guy. You've just understood, you know, wh what my job was and you've come around. And, and so not, you know, I don't change. Like I'm just the guy I am. And if you want to do an interview or if you will come on the pulp show, that's awesome. Uh, but I don't like, yeah, I, I feel like I'm not, I'm not changing, man. I'm the way I am. And if you're coming around and cool, you know what I mean? That's how I feel. So when those relationships come around again, it might be just a place in their life and career where they understand your role, your job, where you're still the same. Because I even hear you still give Davey crap when he's on your show. You still, a couple of times you'll say something like, ooh, like, how's he going to take And he takes it like, he like almost likes it. It's weird to see how the writers go from hating the things you say to loving the things you say and you say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know, man. I know, right? Like I give him Millsap's crap about how much money he made. And that was one of the things back in the day I wrote, like, I'm like, dude, Davey Millsaps, I, I did the math one time. I talked to an agent, a couple of people that would know. And I was like, Davey Millsaps has made like $8 million in the last, you know, five years or whatever it was. And I'm like, here's his results. And I kind of bagged on his results because they, he was underperforming. I mean, the Honda guys right. were telling me that, right? Um, his bosses were telling me that. So, you know, when he came in on Monday, I'm just like, you've made so much money. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, you're right. Like literally nothing changed, right? I was the same guy that they just came around. What's it like when you have a rider who is not giving in? Like Barsha took a while. Yeah. 
Um, Anderson obviously is still holding the line. He, we're, we're not much progress there. Or even Ricky, you and Ricky didn't speak for my God, like what a decade, like more. Dude, like, uh, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, what's it like though when there's not God, when you put, when you put it like that, Dad? You know, you're right. It was probably ten years, right? Probably a ten year period, right? Where you are like the 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 leading charge of the media in the sport. He's like the biggest name in the sport, and there's like no communication at all. And then, of course, it just takes someone like me to make make the piece. I mean, you're welcome. That's all I got to say. Yeah, 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 absolutely, right? You you had him on the show. You were so you co-hosted the Pulp Show without me. I was in Mexico. You and Wygant come come into my empty house, co-host the show, and you get Ricky to come on. <laughs> it was a real it was a real touche moment. Like I gotta give it up. Like that was something that I yeah. I'm like. That's a good one, Daniel. That hey. was just like a slow golf clap, like, you know. Hey, hey, and the best part is, is you didn't know it was coming, and you're in Mexico getting texts like, dude, Ricky Carmichael is on the Pulp Show, and you're like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was a good one. I just had to just tip my hat to you, like, touche, Daniel Flair. Ah, okay. uh, that was a good show. Your best, it was the best Pulp Show ever uh, produced. Uh, thanks to Wygant, of course. Um was it like even in that capacity because you do your view show i've told you many times it's my it's actually my favorite podcast i even told wygant yesterday in a phone call it is my favorite podcast you jt and weech have a great dynamic you yeah. cover the sport from the track and i love when you guys aren't there because you guys are like fish out of water you're like don't know what to do when you're not there but you guys bring the sport to life so for me in the summertime i, I kind of rely on it i need that information um, but what's it like having that working dynamic where Wygant is such a big part of Racer X, JT is part of like your biggest sponsor, but at the same time, you're all friends. So you're kind of balancing this friend relationship with this business relationship too. I mean, how do you make that work or, or is it kind of easy with them just being who they are? Yeah, that, that's, you're right. It is a weird dynamic, right? Because I work for Racer X. Wygant is my boss. He's the online editor and I write online mostly. So he's my boss over there, which I joke about, but it's true. And then, yeah, JT works for a company that, you know, is I'm, I'm their biggest media spend, right? And yet, but we all had this friendship before all of that happened. So yeah, when you think about it, it's super conflicted, right? But um, that, no offense to you, Daniel, no offense to uh, other people we've had on there, but it's, we, I hear, I hear this in DMs and, and fans, the three of us are what people want to hear. And when somebody else jumps in there, like you did a couple of weeks ago, or, you know, uh, Jimmy Albertson has, Ping has over the years, people are like, it's not the same, man. It's not the same. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. Sometimes we have lives and we can't do it, you know? Uh, but it's, it is the dynamic of the three of us, right? It really is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm forever going to take up the team side of stuff uh, with setups and stuff like that. JT's forever going to take up the fragile little riders, and dealing with their setup and 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 we just gonna cut it in the middle right and he's gonna be and you know he he's the voice of the motocross series and so he's gonna have that part of things covered where he just spent 30 minutes on the review show this week apologizing for the broadcast that he had nothing to do with but he's <laughs> the voice of that um it is a unique dynamic people people dig it and the three of us i mean jt and i have had some epic uh arguments right now and i'm so happy that you and him currently are in a battle first of all What's the common denominator here, people? It's JT. It's JT and Weege in the weather. It's JT and Blair about a certain rider. And then it's JT and me about a bunch of things. There's one dynamic, people. I'm telling you, it's JT. He's a professional, <laughs> He's a professional debater. But yeah, hey, that's... He is frustratingly good at it too, man. He is yeah, under my yeah, skin so, so bad guy. right now. <laughs> He's a smart guy. He gets into it. But I'm telling you, people, it ain't me. It's him. But anyways... Uh, hey, you know, Joe, Ro Joe Robbie, Joe What's Robbie, that? Joe Robbie. Oh yeah, he's, exactly. Joe Robbie. Thank you. I thought I was going crazy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that, but the dynamic of the three of us is what, you know, what people want to hear. And then, you know, I'm the loose cannon a little bit. I'll say whatever. Right. And I don't see the, 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 the part, the part about my job right now that I'm going to divert here a little bit, but I love the freedom I have, man, this, the pulp thing is independently financially successful enough that I can say almost anything I want. And, and you know, and, and obviously racer X is Davey has not been happy with everything I've said and done. And he's explained things from a promoter side of things or from a media side of things. And he's helped me. Davey has helped me a ton uh, in my career, 
But at the same time, I have the independence now where I can say just about anything I want. And uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, I, but again, I don't feel like I'm spouting off crazy stuff. I'm not on, you know, I'm not these crackpot guys that are out there, but I do feel like, hey man, I can say about this guy and this person and, and this person. And it's, Daniel, it is a nice feeling. It is a great feeling. I, I've, I, again, I, it's gotta feel good because I just saw on your Twitter, you have a poll going, is Jason Wygant ruining the sport? There's been like 1,300 votes. A lot of them say he is, which he's not. And that's yeah, your boss right. at Racer X. And you have a poll going on your Twitter if, to see if he's ruining the sport. And that's your boss at Racer X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's what I mean. It's great. It's fantastic. <laughs> a, lot of free, a lot of freedom there. Um, right. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the writing side. Again, you still write articles and your observations. And I, I know you do a lot internationally. Do you like that part still? Do you like the, I feel like, like as a runner, running sucks unless you're a runner, then running is cool. Is it like that for you or you're a writer? So you're in the zone. So it keeps, I just, I, for me, I can't write a paragraph and you just keep writing in 2021. And I'm just, I, do, yeah. do you like that part? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. Now I feel like some of it's redundant, right? Like, so my observations column, I started that again in 07, 06, 07. No one was writing like that. No one was, you know, I, one time I was like, Wyndham at, at Freestone, I was like, uh, I wrote, man, how much is it to ship Kevin Wyndham all the way to Freestone postage wise? Cause he sure mailed this race in, you know what I mean? And I was just like, oh my God. Like, so that's the stuff that I wrote, right? Uh, K-Dub just kind of rode around and like went six, six on the day or something. Anyways. Um, yeah. That column has been something I do. Yeah, I'm going on 14 years of 29 columns a year about the weekend's race. And it's 3,000 words. It's 4,000 words. Nobody writes like that. Like, it's, it's, uh, it's an insane amount of work. But I have things I need to say. And that, 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 damn it, I'm going to say them. But yeah, the writing, Daniel, I feel like the writing keeps me sharp, right? Like, it just keeps me on it. It keeps me sharp. It keeps me new, it gives me new ways to express myself. Um, you know, when you're talking for five hours on a pulp show or on the review pod for an hour, sometimes you, you only have one shot to get it out and make it succinct and make it uh, make sense and everything else. While the writing, you got you, got, you can do whatever you want and you can, you can redo the sentence 14 times or the paragraph 14 times. Um, so yeah, I feel like the writing is something, I don't always like it. Uh, we, we do features for the Race Rex magazine. And if I get a feature assigned to me that where I'm not into the topic, and that happens, right? They're like, hey, Mathis, write about, uh, write about this widget. And I'll be like, eh, I don't really into the widget, but you know, a job's a job and I got to write about the widget. Stuff like that is tough for me because I don't have any passion behind it. I don't care about this widget. But if I, got a, if I have an idea and I, get, I can pitch it and I can write it, like right now I'm doing another long form story, which you know, I've done a bunch of those and those are passion projects. I don't get paid any extra to do them. Racer X doesn't ask me to do them. I just, I'm like, what about no fear? And what about Kevin Windham when he broke his leg? And what about yeah. Motor Triple X? You know, that kind of stuff, honestly, that stuff writes itself. I love it. I'm passionate. Um, so I enjoy those types of stuff. But sometimes it can be a grind. Absolutely. Sometimes it's a grind. But, um, you know, I write for uh, Adam Wheeler at On Track Off Road. I used to write for MX Vice, uh, do some stuff for Moto Online. Um, you know, I've written for some German supercross mag or German motocross magazines. I wrote for DBR in Australia. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had a gamut of international publications for sure. When it comes to doing the podcasting, it, it, there's no rules, right? You just, it just, there, there's a million ways you could go about it. But when it comes to writing articles, there are rules as far as structuring writing. Uh, from what I know, you didn't go to journalism school, so you're not like a you know, like a scholar to journalist, but how hard was it for you to become a good writer and, and understand how to write correctly? Because again, I know you have the freedoms to do what you, or say what you want to say in your writing, but you do have to write a certain way for it to be attractive. Like how did, did that come along in time or were you good at that right out of the gate? I think I was okay at it out of the gate. As a kid, I used to type stories on a typewriter. I would, I would like, I'm talking eight, like, nine, 10. Like the actual, old. like. <laughs> yeah, I would type writer. stories about superheroes because I was into comics. And so I would write, I would type these stories and I just was into it, right? I've always been well read. I've read a ton of books and that helps you a lot to, to be a good writer by reading, by reading books. 
So yeah, I didn't really take any courses, but I did do enough to somewhat get started. And then like anything, right, I, it's been 15 years. So I, I'm, I've gotten better at it. I've been able to polish it, but still like I'll hand in something and Coombs will take it and edit it because he's the editor of the magazine. He gets final, you know, look at the article and Davey will make changes and not, not, not insert stuff and not take out stuff, but he'll make changes that are so good. I'm like, damn it. Like, that's how you write that. That's what you right. say, right? Like he's so, he's still a mentor when it comes to that stuff where I'm like, man, is he good at it? Like, and he actually took journalism school, you know, in, 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 w, in w, WVU. Um, so I, I still, when I see Davies corrections to stuff, fixes stuff, I should say, I'm just like, damn it, I got a long way to go. Cause he's really good at it. So yeah, it's a constant, the writing is the toughest thing for me to do. I feel like I'm okay at it. I don't feel like I'm good or even great. I'm okay at it. And it's always a, a, a desire to get better at it. But man, Daniel, in 2021, nobody wants to read anymore anyways. You know what I mean? Like I had a friend tell me, a good industry person that you know, he's like, I don't read Instagram captions anymore, man. I don't got time for that. And you're like, what? He's like, I just watch stories. And you're like, <laughs> so we went from not reading books to not reading articles to not reading Instagram captions. Now we just watch the stories. Like, I'm just like, sweet Jesus. Like we're, we're in a bad spot. Hey, pretty soon, like letters won't matter. Like what is the <laughs> yeah. point? Yeah, exactly. We don't write nothing anymore. We just yeah, talk. It's, it's, it's brutal, man. It's the way we're in right now. And it's just going to get worse as the kids, you know, that like that you, you're, you know, your kid or whatever else, it's just going to get worse because the good old fashioned, I'm going to read a book. I don't know if that's, those people are going to, you know, last much longer crazy times it's definitely a weird transformation a uh, couple more questions for you i do want to talk about just the media in general um again you i'll just say it you're, you're kind of the leading charge in the media and moto anyone that wants information they're going to you first you're you're, you're kind of leading that charge the media landscape is always changing obviously you know that as well what responsibilities do you have in media to again you be authentic you got to be you but you do have to cover the sport or incidents in a correct way because you got people from all over the world relying on you for their information. Um, this question goes to the media in general. Like, what responsibilities do we have as all, in all of us to cover what needs to be covered, have that opinion, but also be able to be responsible with it? Because I feel like we're kind of at that nah, spot where there's a little bit of irresponsible media out there too. Yeah, but don't I, mean, you I, I guess like what's Daniel, your? But don't you feel? And we just saw this with election stuff. Like, and we see this in the last. I don't know, five, six years that media more than ever doesn't like, doesn't need to report the truth. They don't need to talk about the truth. And, and we're just accepting as a society, we've turned the world and, and, and this is, a, and then of course, by extension, we've turned the moto media a little bit into this WWF, WWE style where you're like, I know that's not real, but I still, I'm going to talk about it like it's real. It's a bizarre world we're living in where this stuff is getting reported on and you're like, what reality is this in? Like, what, what are we in? So it is a weird time in, to be, you know, in moto media or even in the media in general. I mean, you know, whether it's the left or the right, whatever side of the news is going on, they're slanting it pretty badly. In some cases, there's, there's people that are just telling outright lies and reporting on it as if it was true. And you're just like, wait, what? And this is, we're all fine with this. Uh, somewhere along the line, we as a society became fine with this. And it's weird to me, man. So, you know, in my side of things as a media guy in our sport, I'm just gonna go to the races, report on what I see, talk to the people involved. And I hope that that work stands out. And you know what? And if you don't like Racer X or Steve Mathis, there's Swap Moto Live and that Anton guy, and there's there's Guy B and, and Vital MX. And, and you know, there's a few people that are still, in my opinion, dedicated to putting out the right media and talking about the facts as they happen and, the, and everything else behind the scenes. So I don't know. Yeah, like it's bizarre, right? And we've seen this, there's a whole YouTube section of Moto people that don't go to the races that come up with these theories. And I'm just like, okay, why, why would you believe that? But damn it daniel people do people do and it blows my mind but i think it's a cause of a bigger part of society somewhere along the line the media quote unquote and this is more like mainstream stuff has lost the trust of the people 
right? Somewhere along the line, the media has lost the trust of the people and the people are like, I can no longer believe you, Mr. Big Time Media Guy. So I am gonna go over here. And those people have voices and it's, uh, it's crazy. Do you feel like it's one of those things where instead of there being a story that has truth, and this goes in Moto2, um, and then you can add an opinion to that has changed to where now the opinion is the power and then they just take bits and pieces of the truth to make their opinion seem valid. You know what I mean? It's like there's been a switch from truth, opinion follows to opinion and let's find some truth to make it work. You feel like there, that's the switch we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit of a switch. I mean, look, there's been editorials in newspapers for a hundred years. A columnist will take a subject and write his opinion on it. And, and that's, that's fine. That's somebody's educated opinion on it. So there's a difference between an editorial and a, and a, and a feature, you, re, you know, that you're reporting on the news, like, you know, uh, uh, cat man rescues cat in tree is a news story that you talk about the man, you talk about the cat in the tree, you talk about the tree, you talk about how the cat got in the tree and everything else. And that's the story. And then there's a guy that writes, I think you shouldn't have rescued that cat because you put the public in danger. That's an editorial. So there's different things, right, to, to do it. And see my that, cat? that line is blurred. Oh, I see, see the cat. My cat. Your cat. Yeah, I have a basset he, heard, around he heard you talking about him. He just, oh, he wanted yeah, to be yeah. in the video. <laughs> so yes, and somehow the news has become an editorial. Yeah. And, yep. and so, you know, when people see Tucker Carlson or Jake Trapper, Tapper, Trapper, whatever it is on CNN and, and Fox, like those guys are editorializing their comments, their columnists. Mm -hmm. That's not the news, that's their opinion. But that's all blurred now, man. It's all just become like, wait, are you, you know, I want the facts and then some editorial and some opinion is great. Um, and that's what I do. Like my, my observations column is, a, it's an editorial. Um, that's what it is. It's my thoughts on stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a weird different time to be in the media all across everything, I think. And especially, you know, and in our little slice of world, the media, the, the moto media world is, is also there. And I mean, it doesn't take like, look, I don't have any degrees. I graduated high school and then I was a mechanic, right? But somewhere along the line, Sean Brennan and, 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 and Brandon Short at the moto media and moto and supercross has allowed me to have coverage. And I think it relies those guys, the, the people that are in charge of the media in our sport, in indoors and outdoors, they have to maybe make some hard decisions. And I think they have on who's, who's allowed to cover the sport and what mm -hmm. your audience is. And it used to be, Daniel, even, you know, when you were racing, like there were, I mean, you could just show up and be like, hey man, you know, I have a blog and you could get a media pass and get access to teams and riders. And I think they've cut that down a little bit. And I think it's a good thing because yeah, you should have some sort of, luckily I got in early, uh, but you should have some sort of following in 2021 to cover the sport. Some sort of background that shows you have an audience and you are actually making a living at this. Right, makes sense. Um, that, yeah, good answer. That's, I mean, that's, I was curious of your thoughts on that and it's, they reflect mine pretty much dead on. Um, last question for you again, you, you talk about these lifts you've had in success with the show and the numbers Watson and then the rotating chair um the video side of things I know you're a driven person I know you're not satisfied like what what what's next or what could be next I mean what what do you want to do to take that next step and continue to elevate your game because it's it's kind of a never-ending thing you know I'm out to uh crush main event moto that's my next goal um that show it absolutely needs to go down. R right, right. Which is why you keep having that guy on your show and then talking about that show while he's on your show. So you're, you're doing a really bad job at it. Yeah, I know, right? But hey, when you started your show, your podcast show, like, were you listening to DMXS and me? And like, hey, I can do better or I, can, I got a different view on it. Like when you started your podcast, because now we have, you know, there's, I don't know, 30 podcasts about Moto out there, whatever number there is. And at the time there was two for a long time. It was me and DMXS guys. Um, what was your motivation for starting a podcast? Like, were you like, Hey, I, I you know, 
I think I can, you know, because you are well spoken and you're funny and you've got these great stories. You wore LBZ in supercross races. I mean, right there that you deserve your own podcast because of that. But um, you know what I mean? Like, why, why did you start your podcast? I don't even remember why I did, but I do remember that I wanted to be different than you and DMXS. Same thing you said. I wanted yeah. to do it different. That's why for me, my show has always been like my buddies. Like it's more of like just a hangout show. Right. Um, like we don't bring on, and this is it's not fair to say, because I do bring on credible guests, but it's you bring on like the, the, the true guys that are at the track, the mechanics, the teams, the industry people were for me, it was like me and my buddies just wanted to kind right. of talk crap, to be honest. Right. So there really wasn't a method in it. And again, we've kind of plateaued because we've just, we've done our thing and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, but that's what, again, goes back to my question for you is you, you, you had an idea in the beginning, but the idea keeps shifting into bigger and better. I, I don't really have like a vision outside of what I'm doing, but I, I'm assuming you do like you, you keep elevating. So like, that's what I'm saying is what, what, what is that next elevation? Well, well pre COVID and I think you were involved. Did you, did we ever get you on a live show? I've never done one of the live ones at, oh. at the races, no. We need to do that. But pre-COVID, those live shows were our next thing, right? Um, you talked about me, Weege, and JT. Well, we would add us three on a stage. And somehow, Daniel, people would pay money uh, to see us. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, Keeper came in. You know, we got Reed and Villapoto at the Vegas one. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, different riders come in. Brayton's done them. Um, and that was sort of the next step was like, hey, man, we can take these things to – Friday nights before the races and, and, and Sean Brennan's been to some of them. And, you know, some of these people, we had 250, 350 people pay money to come see us argue about Marty and Stu and, you know, whatever. Um, so that was the next step for us. Like they, they were working. It was bizarre, but it was really working. People were loving it, man. And, you know, th those shows are a, like a combination of like, and you know, this from being a TV guy and being a host, like there's, I don't want to just drone and I want to, I don't want to just drone on with information from you. I need to entertain you also. Yeah. So that's where the, you know, how much is entertainment and how much is info that they need. So th th that was a mix on the live shows of us trying to figure that out. And at times we nailed it at times we didn't, uh, you know, so we each had some great stories about his growing up and flagging and, you know, so we kind of, we kind of veered off on some live show stuff. I feel like that, when we get back to normal here in the, in America, which we're almost there, I feel like that's the next step, like doing more of those live shows. Um, the responses were great. People were able to sit in their audience and laugh and joke and then meet us afterwards for a picture or for a handshake or tell us a story. Um, so that's, those were pretty neat, man. I was enjoying those. So we'll get back to those. Um, you know, we have an idea uh, to do, to expand the pulp show. Um, we have an idea we're working on. Um, that's more Marxist territory than I am, but we have an idea. The Pulp Mex fantasy thing is growing. Um, that's a real big source of, uh, of income and, and excitement for us over there on the fantasy side of things. Yeah, so, I'm sure all yeah, the uh, local, I'm sure all the local therapists are making a lot of money because of that Pulp Mex fantasy too, for all the people that have to go to therapy after. I know, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think we got some ideas for fantasy. We got an idea for the Pulp show that will help the video side of things, and then more of those live shows when we get back to normal. Uh, selling tickets and having those people do the live shows. And, you know, Yamaha was involved in those and they loved it, man. The Yamaha guys would come out and they're like, this is awesome. Like people are, you know, these, these people are all enthusiasts. They're paying money, 20 bucks, 25 bucks on a Friday night to come watch you idiots. But uh, Fly and Yamaha really liked it, that kind of stuff. That's core people, that's enthusiasts. That's people that'll be like, I want to support Yamaha and fly because I'm here and I love these guys. Right. I love these guys so much that I'm paying money to watch them talk on stage. Uh, and uh, so that, yeah, those are a couple of things that I think are the next step for us at Pulp. So a $30,000 a year job at racer X going to go into media. I'm going to go for it with your little plug in your phone and now millions of downloads and hundreds of people showing up to watch you guys just talk yes. crap live. Yeah, Dude. yeah, it's phenomenal. It's amazing. And, and like I said, twenty-one thousand dollar American Express bill balance. That I was just like, how am I going to pay this? But I paid it. I paid it off. So that's awesome, man. Well, hey, thanks for joining me on Beyond the Track. We want to do this for a long time, and uh, I have to imagine I'll be seeing you here very, very soon. 
Yes, sounds good. Thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate it. And Daniel, uh, there's a spill over in the aisle uh, over there, so you might want to get it. Yep. I've already been told in my earpiece. Uh, that's why I'm cutting the interview short. I got to get to it right now. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody.